All right, so welcome, Jonathan. Um, it's a pleasure to host you for, uh, for today's coffee seminar, and uh, I'll leave you the floor. Great. Uh, well, well, thanks very much for inviting me. So um, today I'm going to share some joint work with Isaac Layton, um, Carlos Braquera, uh, Barbara Scola, and Zach Willer Davies. Um, and um, feel free to um, interrupt me throughout the talk because it's um, a topic which is kind of in the intersection of quantum information theory, quantum gravity, um, open quantum systems. And so it's sometimes, um, um, you know, it's confusing for everyone, including myself. So please just uh, answer questions as we go. Um, good. Or are you, people are also welcome to put them in the chat and I think I might see them, so. Okay, so, um, the, uh, I guess the motivation comes from um, thinking in some sense about what I would call a framework rather than a particular theory. So for example, all our theories that we currently have either fit into the framework of quantum mechanics in the case of all our, all the, all the, all our theories about matter um, or the theory or the framework of classical mechanics, um, which in this case is gravity, but we also have you know, classical mechanics which we can apply to any um, any theory we want, so I'll call these theories and uh, sorry frameworks, and then theories fit into this. Um, there's been a lot of effort, um, including some of the people here, in order to construct maybe alternatives to these two frameworks. Um, but thus far, most of them are fairly limited. Um, they maybe have you know trivial dynamics or something like this, um, and so what we only have at the moment are these two frameworks. And so I think it's an interesting question just from a purely foundational point of view to ask the question, um, can we combine these two frameworks? Can we have a quantum system? Can people see my cursor here? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Can people combine quantum mechanics with classical mechanics? Can we have a, for example, a qubit, a two-level quantum system, which also interacts with a um, say a, a particle which lives in phase space. Can we do that? Now, of course, we can do it um, in some circumstances, and we do it all the time. For example, in the double slit experiment, we have two uh, slits and the wall and walls of a box and a screen at the other side. And these we all treat classically. Um, we have often particles which move in a potential. So this is always possible. The, the potential is treated classically. Um, and so classical systems can react onto quantum systems. That's not a problem at all. The problem happens when we want to consider the back reaction, when we want to, to have a quantum system which back reacts on a classical system. And there's been a huge debate um, in the literature for some time with people arguing uh, back and forth. Um, I should actually probably update this. Um, there's, you know, results as early as, as, you know, up until this year, which argue the issue back and forth. Um, so just a bit of history. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this in order to understand gravity. Um, previously, when people, you know, because there people are either interested in quantizing gravity and struggling, um, or they're interested in some effective theory where we treat space-time as classical. And for this, people usually thought of the semi-classical Einstein's equations, uh, semi-classical Einstein equations, which we know has is pathological when the fluctuations are large. People are also interested in this question um, in the context of quantum chemistry. There, they often get negative probabilities, and they're often not that worried about that because Maybe the regime they're interested in doesn't have negative probabilities. Um, nonetheless, despite this like a huge debate back and forth, there's actually been some simple examples of theories in which one can treat one system classically while the other system remains quantum. So this dates back to the mid 90s. And there's even been attempts to construct and you know actually make consistent theories of Newtonian gravity where um, you know, through a, a kind of a measurement and feedback approach. Um, 
I think this question has become even more interesting recently because there's a whole bunch of um, experiments which um, uh, you know are maybe feasible within the next decades, um, which can be used to actually test the quantumness of gravity. Um, in this talk, I'm not going to really um, spend a lot of time talking about um, why I think it's reasonable um, that we not quantize gravity. Um, there's a, there are actual, you know, I think various reasons to consider this possibility, um, mostly because gravity is a, can be thought of as a theory of space time, unlike any other field theories, um, and is very intimately connected with our, our um, with the parameter time, which we need um, as an external parameter in quantum theory. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, um, although I'm happy to address that in questions. Um, I'll say that my motivation comes partly because if one believes in information destruction in black holes, then I think one needs to consider these sorts of theories because there's a no-go theorem um, due to Coleman, which says that if you have a purely quantum theory, you can't have fundamental information destruction. I'm also interested as a possible effective theory and as a foil or toy model in which to understand quantum gravity. But I also think it's reasonable to think of it as a fundamental theory. Andrea, are you? Um... We are here Okay. and uh, we're following. Uh, and take the opportunity, if you want to ask a question, we are muted, so you can just speak. Um, what do you mean by a sandbox slash foil of quantum gravity? Right. So I mean that, okay, so if you, there's a whole bunch of problems in constructing a quantum theory of gravity, which are not very tractable. Um, problems with the constraints, because gravity is a constraint theory, the problem of time, um, even just um, trying to understand. So, uh, so th there are a bunch of problems like that, which are not really tractable in a quantum theory, but they are tractable in this theory. Um, and uh, things are much simpler if you treat the gravitational field classically. Um, also, when people were constructing, um, you know, when you think of, uh, there's also various problems to do with what it would mean to have mixtures of trajectories uh, of different causal structures, classical mixtures of, of causal structures, which is, easier to think about than superpositions of causal structures, for example. Um, and when people are thinking about a quantum theory, I think the useful analogy is the Louisville equation of classical mechanics. So it's interesting to consider the Louisville equation in order to understand some of the issues that are raised in quantum gravity. So that's, yeah, that's what I mean. Okay, so thanks. So let me um, go over the results. Um, we're able to derive the most general form of classical quantum dynamics. We find that there are two classes of classical quantum dynamics, one which is continuous in phase space and one which has jumping or hopping terms. Um, we're able to construct a consistent um, theory of general relativity in quantum field theory, um, such that the classical or the some limit of it is um, classical general relativity. Um, and some, I think a really nice, um, well, bonus is that one is able to derive the Born rule and the measurement postulate for free. Um, and um, one other nice bonus is there's something called the decoherence versus diffusion trade-off, which is one of the things I'm going to be talking about here, and maybe the main thing I'll be talking about, which um, can be used to experimentally constrain these theories. So there are um, even though the entanglement experiments are possibly uh, decades away, these decoherence versus diffusion experiments are um, can already be used to constrain the theory. Good. So um, the plan of my talk, I'm going to talk about this um, uh, decoherence versus diffusion trade-off, which will allow us to test um, the quantum theory of gravity. I may um, talk a little bit about the semi-classical Einstein equation, which is what is usually used um, in this field versus a master equation approach. Um, and 
um, then I might, uh, I'll get a little bit into the formalism and the most general form of this classical quantum or CQ dynamics. And at the end, I will show some, uh, um, the, you know, I'll give you the theory of where we are able to have a theory of general relativity and quantum field theory. So that's the plan for the talk. So let's go to the first bit, which is um, this decoherence versus diffusion trade-off. Um, and it comes from, um, um, I'll, I'll give you just kind of a, a very uh, general feeling of it, um, rather than the mathematical proof, because I think it's very intuitive why you need such a trade-off. Um, and I'll start with a thought experiment, which is due to um, mostly to Feynman at the Chapel Hill, the famous Chapel Hill conference in 57, um, but I think an improved version due to Aronoff. And there's been a number of related no-go, um, supposedly no-go theorems. Um, and the thought experiment goes like this. Um, I imagine doing a double slit experiment with a massive particle, an electron or the moon. Um, and during the experiment, when the moon or the electron is going through one of the slits, I imagine measuring the gravitational field that this particle produces. So I can imagine having some pendulums to measure the gravitational field. I could imagine in the distant field using a gravity wave detector. Um, but whatever method I use, it's not really important. The point is that the particle will um, produce a gravitational field. And in particular, it will produce a different gravitational field depending on whether it goes through the right slit or the left slit. So over here, it's going through the right slit, for example, and as it travels, it will um, produce a gravitational field. That gravitational field, if it's classical, can be measured. And what Feynman and Aronoff argued is that if the gravitational field that the particle produces is classical, then we can measure it to arbitrary accuracy without disturbing the particle and we can therefore know which slit the particle went through. And if we know which slit the particle went through, then there cannot be an interference pattern. So in, con you know, in, in contrast to what we observe. Um, so that's the, exper uh, the thought experiment and, and the motivation for why we should quantize the gravitational field. Um, does anybody have any questions about this thought experiment? Doesn't look like it here. Okay. So if you think about what happens with the electromagnetic field, you can ask why, um, why do we still observe an interference fringe? Well, um, the, the electromagnetic field here represented by E, L, and ER is different depending on whether the electron went through the left slit or the right slit. Um, if it went through the left slit, it'll be left in one state versus if it went through the right slit, it'll be left in another state. And the result will be a, an entangled state because the electromagnetic field is quantized. Um, nonetheless, we still get an interference pattern. And the reason is that the electromagnet electromagnetic field is different depending on whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit, but it's not orthogonal. Uh, they're in non-orthogonal states. So there's still a large overlap between the electromagnetic field depending on whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit. And because this overlap is large, can be large, you can still get an interference pattern. So there can still be large coherences here um, in the uh, density matrix of the particle. Um, on the other hand, for, um, let's just say for, uh, you know, the, for a classical um, state of the gravitational field, you cannot have a different classical state of the gravitational field, which is different depending on whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit, but is non-orthogonal. They will be orthogonal states. Um, however, if the coupling is produces a probability distribution over different gravitational fields, then you can have two different probability distributions which are uh, different, but which have a large overlap. So here I'm imagining that the particle, if it's traveling through the right slit, produces a different probability distribution over gravitational fields. Um, depending on how uh, long this box is, the coherence time will be longer and longer. Let's call that tau. And the longer the coherence time, the more these two distributions will get pushed apart. 
Um, but if they have if they have some overlap, then there can still be um, coherence. And so, roughly, um, what you can imagine is that the wider these distributions are, the longer the coherence can be. So let's call that D two is the um, let's call D two the width of these distributions. If the width is very large, then you can still have large coherence times. And let's call the force the the you know the force that the particle is producing on the gravitational field. If the force is very large, then you also uh, you get shorter coherence times. So this is this trade-off that we call the decoherence versus diffusion trade-off. And from a mathematical point of view, you can write it in terms of the coupling constants of the theory. Here, D0 is like the Lindbladian coupling. D1 is the force. And D2 is the diffusion. And you find this coupling constant, which roughly says this, that the coherence time has to be less than the expectation value, uh, the, the diffusion coefficient divided by the expectation value of the force squared. I think this would be a good time for questions if there are any, because this is, I think, the main point. I think it's fairly intuitive, but it does take a bit of thinking about it, and I'd be happy to take questions. So in this model, when the superposition happens, the gravitational field kicks one of the two configurations. So sorry, sorry, can you repeat that? So uh, I kind of missed uh, what happened when you went from the quantum to the classical case. So when the, in this model, the, the field is classical. Yeah. And when the particle goes into a superposition, what happens to the field exactly? So um, if um, all I'm going to say at the moment, so we, we'll, we can get to the exact dynamics in a bit, but all I'm saying at the moment is that what we want is that if the particle was going through the right slit, it should create a probability distribution over possible okay. classical okay. gravitational fields. Okay. okay, now I understand. If it goes to the left slit, it should create a different distribution. And these distributions need to have some overlap in order for there to be an interference pattern. Because if you want to, you're going to measure the gravitational field. And so say we're here, we measure the gra gravitational field. And in a lot of cases, we cannot determine by measuring the gravitational field which slit the particle went through. And that allows us to have interference patterns. Okay, no, I understand now. Okay. Um, hi, hi, Jonathan. Can I ask you? And if it's Marius. First of all, sorry, um, I'm a bit late. I had to come uh, to Cyprus to see my family in the end. Um, so I missed the first part. Sorry if it's going to be a very silly question. But what do we mean by decoherence if it's a classical system? So what we mean here by, um, so the trade-off is between the decoherence in the quantum system, All right. so it's the or the coherence. So we are trying to do an interference experiment with a quant with an electron. So it's going through the left slit or the right slit and uh, or is able to go through the left slit or the right slit and is in a superposition. So is forming an interference pattern. Um, and so that is the, that's what we mean by, so we're talking about decoherence in the quantum system versus diffusion in the classical system. So, I see, okay, so this is the coherence of the matter, which is quantum versus diffusion of the field sourced by this quantum Exactly, matter. exactly. So the force okay. is the back reaction of the quantum system on the classical system, it's the force of the back reaction. The diffusion is the diffusion in the classical system and the coherence time of the quantum system, and they need to satisfy this trade-off. Okay, and the coupling between the, um, a quantum source and the field that is sourced by this quantum matter, is it generic or is it of some form? Sorry if you said it before, I just missed No, it. no, that's that's great. So um, here I'm just giving an a, a kind of a rough argument um, based on this thought experiment by Feynman and Aronov where they perform an interference experiment using an electron, um, say, which produces this gravitational field. The coupling, um, what we're able, the, the, the formal part of the proof is that we derive the most general form of classical quantum coupling. And using that most general form, we then are able to prove this result. So the couplings here, I'll show you when we get to the master equation, 
um, the general form of the master equation, but roughly speaking, okay. the back reaction is given by a coefficient called D1. D0 gives the Lombladian couplings and D2 gives the classical diffusion couplings. And you can effectively, what you're doing is you're doing what's called a kramer moyal expansion in the master equation. This is often done when people look at the most general, you, you know, you can talk about the most general form of classical uh, stochastic processes, the most general form of quantum processes like Lombardian evolution. And so from those sorts of considerations, we arrive at this trade-off. I see. So the idea is that somehow this will have some phenomenological consequences in the sense that <clears throat> if you see a certain amount of coherence in matter, you can exclude this type of theories or something like that. Exactly. Right? And I'll, I'll, man I'll get to that in the next slide. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. So this is exactly um, what you're asking about. So, so we, we want to measure the coherence time, and we can do that by considering a double slit experiment. We perform a double slit experiment with some um, uh, electrons, or actually it turns out that the, the best figure of merit is um, produced by something which is very dense. Um, so gold atoms, for example, and I know that in interference experiments, people are very impressed by people interfering very um, heavy particles like buckyballs. But in fact, the best constraints we get is not due to heavy particles, but rather dense particles. Um, so gold is better than buckyballs. Um, and so you measure the coherence time in a double slit experiment. And you, know, you want to demonstrate that you can have very long coherence times if you have very long coherence times, then this trade-off requires you to have a lot of diffusion in the gravitational system. And so then you go and you perform a Cavendish experiment. So we measure the force due to gravity or the due to say a one kilogram mass. And when we perform this experiment to measure a one kilogram mass, we're gonna find a lot of uh, jiggling around. There'll be a lot of noise in that experiment. And we want to, to put a bound on how much noise there is in that experiment. So we perform a, pre a precision measurement of gravity, like a Cavendish experiment, and put a bound on how much diffusion and noise there is in the gravitational experiment. And we can now, um, under the assumption that gravity holds, that the theory reproduces gravity to um, you know, some short distance, we're able to put a bound on the coupling constants and therefore rule out various theories or the parameter space of various theories. Is that is that clear? Yeah. I'm, I, I'm happy to take uh, questions here because it is a little bit, if you haven't seen this before, um, then it may be uh, okay. a little bit. So um, I could, uh, I mean, I didn't follow the first part, so, uh, but it's true that they do not see intuitively what is the relation between the coherence and diffusion. Um, uh, I don't know what to ask, though. I mean, do you have some intuition of what's going on here? So the yeah, maybe I'll go back to, say, um, yeah. I mean, I think it's worthwhile just saying it again anyway. Um, maybe I'll go back to this interference experiment here. So we're performing an interference experiment. Um, and the analogy is with the electromagnetic field. When the particle goes through the left slit, it creates a different electromagnetic field compared to when the particle goes through the right slit, ER or EL. And the thing about quantum theory is that those two states are different. They have to be different because the particle is going, you know, has a different tra trajectory, is colliding with a different set of walls. Um, but those two states have a large overlap, and therefore we can have co these large coherences between the, you know, in the case when the particle goes to the left slit versus the right slit, there can be coherence between these two processes because the electromagnetic field has large overlap, even though it has is left in a different state. Sure, and, but now the electromagnetic field is it quantum in that case? This case yes, in that it? case is quantum, okay. and okay. in quantum theory you can have states which are different. But are but are nonetheless have large overlap, mm -hmm. and and so the analogy is that in we want to produce 
uh, if we have a stochastic theory where the gravitational field is produced stochastically, we now have two different probability distributions depending on whether the particle went through the left slit or the right slit. And those two different probability distributions, if they have a large diffusion, meaning they have a large width, they can be in two different states. We can have two different probability distributions, which nonetheless have large overlap. And if they have large overlap, then measuring the gravitational field will not determine which slit the particle went through, and therefore we can still get an interference pattern. Uh, so, okay, so let me digest this a bit. So even though this is a classical system and they are going to be orthogonal, what is not, is okay, you have probability distributions now. Yeah, that's the main thing. So in, in, in Feynman and Aronov's thought experiment, they were imagining that, the, that only a single field is produced. Um, uh, there's only a single, you know, the, the classical field is in a, a particular state, depending on whether it went through the left slit or the right slit. Um, and um, if we, and so the, the loophole in some sense in this no-go theorem is that if we have a stochastically produced gravitational field, then we can have a large overlap between the two different distributions and their thought experiment breaks down, you can still have an interference pattern produced by the electron. So because the measurement that doesn't tell you with certainty whether you are seeing orthogonal states of the field or not. Somehow. That's right. So measuring the gravitational field when you have a probability distribution of gravitational fields does not unambiguously determine which slit the particle went through. And so you can have an interference pattern. Okay. But and that's very similar to the, the electromagnetic field case. Well, it's similar to the electromagnetic field case after the electron has hit the wall, um, has hit the screen. During the experiment, actually, the electromagnetic fields are actually in very different states, depending on whether the particle is going through the left slit or the right slit. But once the particle reaches the screen, most of that information has been erased. Sometimes this is called false decoherence. So what actually happens in a real experiment is that the electron actually does decohere because it becomes entangled with the electromagnetic field. But once it hits the screen, that entanglement is erased. On the other hand, if the gravitational field is classical, you cannot uh, you know, erase it because you can imagine someone in principle measuring it throughout the trajectory of the electron. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I get it. Thank you. There was also a question in the room. Uh, yeah, I have a can question. So you're saying you get a probability distribution instead of a superposition here, but is the origin of the probability distribution due to the finite width of the apertures that determine exactly where the particle goes through? I mean, do you have to do a microscopic calculation here to estimate what the value of D2 is? Could you hear that? Um, I didn't. No, I think you have to come yeah. here. Maybe. Uh, maybe you, oh. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, is it here? Yes, it's I'm asking about uh, so Jonathan. This is Brigitte Whaley from Berkeley visiting here. Uh -huh. So I'm asking about the origin of the probability distribution here from the classical gravitational field. Is that is the width here rather than just one particular value because the apertures have finite widths and the particle will go through and possibly get scattered from the edges and so on? Is it is it very detailed microscopic here, or you have a more generic picture? Well, so, so this, um, these coupling constants here and, and this relation is derived for the most general form of the coupling. So we don't want to assume a particular model at all. We just want to derive it for all possible couplings between quantum and classical dynamics. But I'm um, asking, so why, do you, why are you replacing the feynman aharonov assumption of a single gravitational field by a classical probability distribution now then? Well, we're just deriving the most general form of the dynamics. So if you if you just say, let's imagine the most general dynamics between a classical um, between a classical field and a quantum field. And what we actually do is we say, we now want that dynamics to be completely positive and trace preserving, meaning, meaning that it preserves probability distributions. Right. And if we demand that, then we arrive at this trade-off. So the trade-off right. is very general. It doesn't you know, this holds actually for not just gravity, it just holds for any quantum right. classical coupling. And then we apply it to gravity in particular right. in order to uh, 
so, you know, get figures of merit for experiments. Okay. So it's not it's not deriving from any assumption about the physics of this particular setup, but it's just right. you're making rather than saying a single value, saying it just has to be a trace preserving map. That's right. We just say so the, the assumptions are that it has to be linear, trace preserving, yeah. and completely positive, and those are all things it, which you need if you want to preserve the, the the probabilistic structure of the state space, which I think almost everyone would agree is. Um, is necessary, or at least yeah, is, is, a, um, is true, is, is a necessary assumption if you want to preserve the interpretation of the density matrix. Now, the, the only, I think, uh, real physical assumption is that the dynamics is Markovian, uh, meaning that there's no hidden memory here, um, which right. if you believe that this is a fundamental, since we're proposing this is a fundamental theory, um, it's reasonable to assume if it's fundamental, there's no hidden memory. Okay, thanks. Got it. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thanks for those. I hope they've clarified and maybe it'll make a bit more sense when we um, when I show the dynamics. Um, but the headline here is that we perform we perform these Cavendish type experiments and these double slit experiments, and we've produced these figures of merit, which we are, you know, talking to experimentalists about. And our hope is that people will do the experiments and further constrain the theory. Um, and already, some, some, um, some, th you know, some of the parameter space we can already rule out, which I think is exciting. So here are um, uh, various potential models, which we are able to, uh, in some cases, rule out, and in other cases, place um, stringent bounds on. Um, I sometimes talk here about the semi-classical Einstein's equation, um, usually for a gravitational audience, because people often um, say that in order to make the gravitational field, uh, the classical gravitational field represented here by the Einstein tensor, um, in order to make that consistent, with uh, so this is Einstein's equation, um, where on the left hand side we have the Einstein tensor, and the right hand side we have the stress energy tensor, which is a quantum operator. People um, in the field uh, usually replace this with their expectation value and get all kinds of paradoxical behavior. Um, I sometimes talk about this, but I uh, more with the gravity audience, and I guess this is more. Uh, less of a gravity audience, is that right? Yeah, I guess so. We're in quantum information environment, but right. I, I don't know. Are you already familiar with this idea? Oh, I see. Huh? Let's hear it. Okay. We got the. Uh, uh, let's hear it. Uh, sorry, you said. Okay, it. let's hear it. Okay. So, um, so people often. So the, the most common approach. And the reason people rejected, I think, to a large extent, besides this Feynman experiment, the reason people rejected um, keeping the gravitational field classical was because they mostly believed that the only approach was to use the semi-classical Einstein equation. And so this is where we replace the expectation value of the, the stress energy tensor operator with its expectation value. And if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, um, even classically. So I think people, what I think people here will like in this audience is that this was used in gravity. But if you think about it from a purely classical point of view, it is going to be pathological if you replace um, the stress energy tensor, this operator, with an expectation value. And the reason is, is that you're destroying, you're removing any information you can possibly have about correlations between the stress energy tensor and the gravitational field. So for example, if I have a purely classical statistical mixture of the moon being on the left or the moon being on the right, then what we expect to happen if we drop a test mass is that the test mass will, will you know, if the moon is on the left, the test mass will drop towards the moon on the left. If the moon is on the right, the test mass will drop to the moon being on the right. But if we put in the statistical mixture of the moon being on the left with 50% chance and the moon being on the right with 50% chance, if we put that into the semi-classical Einstein equation and take its expectation value, then that looks like two half moons of half mass 
being both on the left and right. And so what happens is both moons, half moons will, you know, start uh, falling into each other and the test mass will fall down the middle. And so that, that, that equation is clearly pathological. Um, that is the best uh, explanation in 30 seconds I've heard of why this <laughs> is problematic. Uh, what's that, sorry, I didn't, I mean, I didn't... No, I'm saying that this is a very good 30 second explanation for what's uh, problematic about that equation. Right, yeah, I, I think one of the nice things about this is that for quantum information people is that you see right away that the issue is that we should consider a density matrix because this, this issue arises in a purely quantum um, setting between two quantum systems which interact and it arises if we have two classical systems which interact. If you take the expectation value of the evolution equation, you will get nonsense. What you need to do is you need to retain the density matrix, which contains the correlations. Um, now, you know, part of this was already known, you know, for example, people have been known since the, I guess, maybe the 90s, uh, or, you know, that, that these things are pathological. But I think what's interesting is that it's pathological even classically. And so what we need to do is we need to account for correlations between um, you know, the mass being on the left and the mass being on the right and what the state of the gravitational field is. So I often just give an example where you take uh, you know, two systems which are both coupled on the, which are both correlated on the left and correlated on the right. And you see that if you take the trace of the equations, you get nonsense. But if you retain the density matrix, you don't. Um, and I will just say, so here's a um, example of the dynamics that we get um, where we keep the density matrix. I'll explain in a bit what this density matrix is because it's a both a probability distribution over phase space and a density matrix in Hilbert space. But if you look at this master equation, if you take a master equation approach where you retain the distribution over classical systems and the quantum distribution over quantum systems, quantum states, sorry, then um, your ape, what we find, in fact, is that you know the test mass will fall to when to you know if, the, if, if we have a superposition or a mixture, then um, then the test mass will react and fall towards the moon on the left when it's on the left and the moon on the right when it's on the right. Okay. Um, I will. Um, now give the general form of the dynamics and how are we for time? I guess I should try and end soon. Is that right? Yeah, we are, we've been talking for 40 minutes. Okay, so let me just give the general formalism and then I'll flash up the equations and we can, we can finish. So remi remember we want to um, find, uh, we have a quantum, quantum mechanics where we have the Heisenberg equation here um, with the, density matrix sigma. We have classical mechanics where we have a distribution uh, row, which evolves according to the Louisville equation, and we want to combine these two things. And the way to combine them is, I think, clear when we think about correlations. We have a probability distribution of the particle being at a particular place in phase space, Q and P, and given conditioned on being in that point in phase space, we have a density matrix. So given that the particle is at a particular point Q and P in phase space, then the qubit will be either in the zero, the one, or you know, there's a whole density matrix over possible states depending or conditional on where you are in phase space. Is that clear? That's, I think, the kind of the main, you know, I think once you have that, then if you're a quantum information theorist, you're just like, oh, of course, and now we just ask for any dynamics which keeps that state space and is completely positive trace preserving. So is there any question about how we um, represent a classical quantum state? Okay. So, you know, if you look at the- Sorry, we do um, have a question here. Why do you need the, can you go back to the slide? Can you go back to the previous slide? Why do you need to have the a factor in the front of the density matrix then? Is that um, there's many ways of writing it. So this is just one way. Um, um, 
where you know I could do, I could write it in a different way. So, for example, if you are in um, if you come from quantum information theory, you might think about this way of writing it, where you have a probability distribution. You have a probability distribution over Z, and here we just represent it as a projector. So this is a fully quantum CQ state, and then conditioned on being in the classical state Z, you have a density matrix. So this is how we often in quantum information theory think about what's called a classical quantum state. Is this is this familiar to people? This should. Yeah. So that's one way of writing it. This is another way of writing it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So you know we we're here. So so we know that in quantum theory we have a, a density matrix which is a trace one operator which is a positive semi-definite matrix. We know in classical mechanics, we have a phase space density, which integrates to one, and it's a positive distribution. And so the classical quantum state is just exactly what you would imagine. And what I just said, that conditioned on being at a point in phase space, we have a, a density matrix over Hilbert space. And it's normalized in the sense that we need to take both a trace and integrate over a phase space. Here, Z is phase space. And so is Q and P, my apologies. But if we integrate over phase space or the classical distribution and take the trace of the density matrix, then that is normalized to one. Um, uh, so just to confirm something, uh, um, Jonathan. Yeah. So Q and P are classical variables and your quantum variable, I mean, the basis of the Hilbert space was the Z, right? No, no, sorry. Z is, um, so it's, and I apologize for this. Z is Q and P. Well, Z could be any classical distribution, any okay. classical degree of freedom. And then sigma is the density matrix in some Hilbert space, which in this case I'm taking to be a qubit. So here's the two-dimensional qubit. And Z is the classical degree of freedom. I've also called it Q and P here, so I apologize for that confusion. I see. Okay, okay. Good. Good. Thanks. So conditioned on the phase space, the point in the classical distribution, uh, the classical... Uh, you know, condition on the classical random variable, you have a density matrix, a qubit in this case. I see which, so the entries of this matrix, I should think of them as additional degrees of freedom, which are of the quantum system. Yeah, right. that's right. You can think of it as a, a two by, for example, a qubit, which interacts with a, a particle in phase space. You can think of the total state space as being a, a two by two matrix whose entries are uh, functionals of phase space. Uh, okay, can I throw one more question here? I mean, uh, maybe I don't want to confuse the discussion, but uh, so if you choose a point in phase space, um, you could always also construct a semi-classical state of uh, a quantum theory. Would that, uh, would, does this formalism also apply if I think of Q and P as labeling semi-classical states uh, of what you're calling a classical theory now or uh, right. So you could think of, um, you could imagine, for example, so one thing we've looked at is you could imagine, for example, that I have a Wigner distribution um, and Q and P are the Wigner distribution of a quantum state. And I'm interested in the classical limit where the Wigner distribution is positive. Is that what you're getting yeah, at, maybe? So it applies to that case to write the format. Yeah. Um, not really. No, because the well, you can you can you can consider that formalism and ask to what extent does it correspond to this formalism, which is something we've looked at. Um, but the um, the difference in those two cases is that in the quantum formalism, you can have the 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 Wigner distribution doesn't need to be positive. Whereas here, if you think about it as an actual distribution, okay. whether where you can measure Q and P to arbitrary accuracy then that has to be a positive distribution in both Q and P. Yes, that's right. Okay, good, thanks. So it has to obey an additional constraint in comparison to the semi-classical form. Yes, we, form which is not shown in the previous slide. It's more than the distribution summing to one. There is also something about the Wigner function hidden somewhere. Well, it's not a Wigner function. So here, it's yeah, it's exactly that. So it's not only that... So we, we demand both that if we integrate over Q and P, it sums to one, but we also demand that rho is a positive distribution. Whereas if this was a Wigner distribution, uh, it right. wouldn't need to. Yeah. All right, yeah, got it, thank you. Good, okay. So now we just turn the crank of quantum information theory that we all know and love, and we say, what is the most general form of 
completely positive trace preserving dynamics. And um, we're able to find the most general form. And you know, I mentioned particular examples were known since the 90s, but we're able to find the most general form of this dynamic. So if, if the dynamics is continuous, it has the following form. We have the Louisville, the Louisville part, which is just you know, the pure gravity part where you just have um, no matter at all. This doesn't involve matter. Then you have what I sometimes, you know, this is like the quantum field theory in curved space part because it's the um, commutator, the Heisenberg part. So the commutator with the matter Hamiltonian with this object, okay, matter and the gravity part. Um, and then you have this funny form, which is called the Alexandrov Garisimov bracket, which um, looks like the um, it's, 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 it's the back reaction. It's the, it's the influence of matter on the gravitational field because this is a Poisson bracket with respect to the classical degrees of freedom in, this, in the case of gravity, the metric. So this is the back reaction part. And then you have this, what looks like a Fokker-Planck term if you're used to stochastic classical dynamics, which is the creation of diffusion. And then you have this pure Lindbladian term here. M here is just the matter Hamiltonian. Well, it's some functional of the matter Hamiltonian. So it's the decoherence due to matter. So this is the kind of, this is not the most general form, but this is an example of the kind of master equation you get. We've also constructed a path integral and a trajectories formalism. Okay. So this is the, I just um, run through the, this is me just running through the, um, uh, you know, the, the turning the crank on completely positive trace preserving dynamics, which you will all be familiar with. Um, but it's just useful to see the different kinds of quantum classical and cl classical quantum dynamics. So you're used to seeing the, the Lindblad equation. Here's the Lindblad equation, right? Where you have the jump terms and the no event terms. Here is the classical analog of the Lindblad equation. It's the Pauli rate equation. So here you have the classical jump terms. If you're at a point in phase space Z prime, you have some rate of jumping to Z. And likewise, this is the no event, the classical no event term. And this matrix must be positive semi-definite. And here is the classical quantum um, most general form where you have both the Lindblad jump terms, the classical jump terms, and the combined no event terms. So it looks, all these classical quantum and classical quantum master equations have a very similar form. And this is the continuous dynamics and the most general and the most general form of the continuous dynamics. And this is by demanding that this is completely positive. This is how we derive the decoherence versus diffusion trade-off. Um, I'm about to send, give you my final slide, um, and so maybe we we'll, can save questions for then. Um, I'll just say that there are path integral formulation of this, um, and. I will just get to my final slide. Um, okay, here's the general. Here is my. Here's our with Zach Weller Davies. Um, this is the path integral for general relativity combined with quantum field theory. Um, and so we've pro, we've we've um, proposed that as an alternative to quantum gravity. So let me just end by saying that there's a whole bunch of uh, challenges which await, and in particular, I think the. Um, most important one is to show that the theory is regularizable or renormalizable. Um, and there's various other, uh, you know, various other, other challenges, but we pro we've proposed what we hope is a, a candidate alternative theory, which we argue can be tested right now in experiments. Um, I'll also mention, you know, my general, my general approach here is that I have no idea if space-time should be treated classical, the, but the key message is that it could be I've been given one to 5,000 odds on any experiment, which I've taken gladly. Um, and the nice thing about, about a theory in which space-time is classical is that it has a number, I think, of nice features, which some people might find unpleasant features, but which I find important, which is that we do not need the measurement postulate. That's not needed anymore. Um, we have information loss, but somehow actually the quantum state remains pure, conditioned on the classical trajectory. And this is all experimentally testable. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Jonathan. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions, but since I'm already close, I will ask you a question myself. Can you elaborate more on this, uh, this point about the measurement uh, postulate not being necessary? Um, so my understanding is by requiring that this most general coupling between classical and quantum is uh, CPTP, you get, you get essentially this, uh, this mixedness of the quantum state, I guess. Right. right. But you don't get an outcome, or do you? Like you still have the same, it's the same similar problem that you still don't know what you're going to get somehow. Right. When um, it's going to become def definite. Whoop. Sorry. Um, so let me go to. Um, yeah. So one of the surprising things which happened, which I have to admit, I was, I was a little bit shocked at, um, which is that we derived this uh, trade off. And then what we found is that when the trade-off is saturated, something really remarkable um, happens. Uh, what do you see now? Do you see the standard axioms? I see quantum mechanics with the commutator and classical mechanics with the Poisson bracket. Mm. OK. Um, well, so oh, sorry, no. my computer is, is acting a little bit funny. Um, so one of the things we found is that when we saturate the decoherence versus diffusion trade-off, that what happens is that we found that the quantum state stays pure conditioned on the classical trajectory. Um, so there is some like uh, fundamental decoherence, but this fundamental decoherence um, is the decoherence you get when you trace out the gravitational field. So if you keep in the gravitational field, the quantum state is pure conditioned on the classical trajectory. And so what happens is, I thought was quite remarkable, is that the, um, in some sense, the classical system um, ends up infecting the quantum system and classicalizes the quantum system. So you start off in a superposition. Sorry, am I... Am I... I, I we can hear you, and uh, I was following. Okay, and, and I think you just see this decoherence versus diffusion double slit experiment, right? Or... Uh, now we see a picture with the green laser and the Cavendish experiment. Uh, okay, now sorry. there's a table with a lot of formulas. <laughs> sorry, Mike. Um... You cannot see your um, the preview of your slides. Yeah, no, for some reason. Um... There we go. So, so what we find is that, um, so this is representing, we start off with a particle in superposition here. Um, oh, God. Okay, well, I, <laughs> what we find is that you have a particle in superposition, and if we saturate the trade-off, what happens is that it, with the probability given by the Born rule, it will start to effectively um, collapse, is maybe not the best word, but it will effectively move to either being in the zero state or the one state or the left state or the right state. And as it does that, it's leaving an, uh, you know, a um, imprint on the classical system. So by reading off the classical system, you can learn exactly what the quantum state is at all times. So somehow you get the Born rule and, um, and you can, you, you know, the state of the quantum system is just pure once you are following the trajectory of the classical system and the trajectory that the classical system takes is governed by the Born rule. And effectively, one sees that the quantum system collapses to one of those two states, for example, in this particular setup. Does that make? Uh, but no, it doesn't make sense to me. So okay, uh, good. So, so you start with a, with, a, with a system in the pure state in the plus, so the position of being on the left and on the right. Huh? Yeah. And then you just let it evolve. And then you let it evolve with the classical system. And what, so, what, for example, in a certain Gerlach type of experiment, um, you know, the, for example, then um, there's a, a zigzag, you know, the, in, this is, for example, a stern Gerlach experiment. So if you monitor P and Q, so here's P and Q of the particle, the classical particle. And if the spin is, so if you start off in a superposition, then some of the time it'll take trajectories look, look like this and half the time it'll take trajectories which look like that. And by monitoring the P in this case of the classical system, you learn whether you're, you end up collapsing to the zero or the one state. 
But isn't that true also for entangled system? If I look at one spin, I learn the other spin. Yeah, but I guess here you don't need the measurement postulate. So we don't need to um, impose the Born rule. We don't need to talk about collapse. We just give you the dynamics in which a quantum system interacts with the classical system. And for free, we just get that the classical system will uh, so, you know, record so the, the spin in a way which causes collapse by the Born rule. I see. So you're saying, Jonathan, that you get the Born rule for the quantum system as a calculation that comes from the um, dynamics of the joint system. That's right. Rather, that's a, okay. Right. So I guess my my philosophy here is that if the gravitational field is fundamentally classical, then um, we just impose, you know, you just impose the, dy the dynamics, um, and for you don't need to say anything about measure, measurement or born rule or anything like that it just comes out so i think if we had discovered these kinds of interactions before we started to have angst about the measurement postulate we may, might have never gone that in that direction and i see and did this calculation is it uh, uh do you get the born rule for specific examples like that or is there some general calculation yeah you can you can you can show that uh, so it that generically if you saturate the trade-off, then that's what happens. I see. Okay. So it has very much to do with this trade-off. So if the if the trade-off is not saturated, then you can have more noise than you want in the quantum system or more noise than you want in the classical system. But if you saturate it, then this magic happens and the quantum state is pure conditioned on the classical trajectory and follows the Born rule. Okay. Thanks. Um, I have a last question that is more general, but uh, at the end, I leave the audience to questions first. Yeah. Um, are there any questions here in the room? Yes. So let me add yeah. a follow-up snap on that. Because you say, well, there's a ball, so still the space of pure, which actually happens a lot in pure continuous measurement. Do you get this anyway? I don't know if I can hear you. I think no, it's better if you come here. Thanks. So I have a follow-up question to this. So it's clear that the state is pure, but if it's following the Born rule, basically what's happening is it in the very first time step, when you're integrating these equations, you're already getting this branching, right? Because you're, pro you're propagating the density matrix, right? So the Born rule uh, is set in at time zero, surely. No, so it's difficult to draw. It's difficult to draw, and it's one of these things about white noise processes, which are hard to uh, capture. Um, this is something my students have really impressed upon me, um, uh, which is what happens that if you, the noise is, as you go, as you look at shorter and shorter times, the divergent, the, the kind of the diffusion in the noise is very large. And so if you only measure the gravitational field at, on very short time scales, you don't learn very much about the particle. So you need to let it, um, you need to kind of collect data over uh, some finite time, and that still doesn't actually really tell you, you know, whether it's a zero or one in this case. So um, this is not a very good, it's hard to actually draw it, but, you know, essentially at short times, there's an, here you kind of see it, that it, it'll kind of zigzag. And so sometimes you you might not, you know, here it's going to be a one, but if you looked at some finite time, you wouldn't know it because it's actually over on the left side here yeah i see that but it's clear that there's no that doesn't appear to be any crossing of those two of the yellow and the blue well that's just an artifact of these particular that's ones so okay. if you if you if you looked at all the trajectories you would see that there's very large overlap initially okay. and that overlap slowly decreases with time okay. and you need to all wait right. a sufficiently long time before it actually okay. you can distinguish right. those two states i get it okay so it's an artifact you've shown us the most beautiful trajectory <laughs> Okay, that's a that's a polite way of putting it. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, now now I'll ask a second question, uh, just to make sure because I think I, I understand. So if you run the dynamics once, you'll get one of these wiggly lines for the state of the system, and naturally, it will either like whatever it's got noise, so it can flip flop around, but eventually it will sink to zero or one. That's well, right. Thank you. Okay, now I understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Also, for the people that are following online, they can just unmute themselves. Uh, 
quick quick question so i suppose when you apply this to gr you need some you would use some hamiltonian formulation of gr with with a foliation and a adm formalism or something like that um, maybe that's something you mentioned already. Uh, is it clear that it becomes diffeomorphism invariant when you... Right. So that's a good question. So the, the first iteration in my 2018 paper had it as a the ADM formalism where you pick a particular slicing. And then it wasn't at all clear that that is, gonna, is diffeomorphism invariant. So it's, um, it's invariant under diffeomorphisms, spatial diffeomorphisms, but... Uh, we, you know, then had the constraint algebra to try and show whether that was, um, whether that was diffeomorphism invariant in space time, and we gave up. And well, we 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 did a lot of work, but we're not able to show show that. Um, since then, though, um, in the last I guess few months, we put on the archive a path integral formulation, and that is actually in three plus one. Um, now, what we have is we have a diffeomorphism invariant theory which is based on the trace of Einstein's equation. So that's a fully different morphism invariant theory. It reproduces the trace of Einstein's equation, but doesn't give you all of Einstein's equation. And then we've proposed one which gives all of Einstein's equation, but we're not able to prove that it's completely positive. So that's the current status of it. Okay, great, thanks. Any more questions? No. So I guess Marius, you have a question. Yes, but only if uh, nobody. But anyway, I just say. I mean, Jonathan, I just wanted to to say first of all that um, I appreciate a lot that you are getting something that can be tested, right? I don't know if you actually believe. If you actually believe, you don't know. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's very important that uh, you know this possibility has not been excluded of uh, the field being stochastic. And it's not as simple as saying, uh, well, this is a classical Einstein equation is pathological. There's more possibilities than that. And having a, um, a way to test in the lab is, um, you know, the true science. Um, now, when you say it's testable now, I guess you mean given current technological capabilities. Um, <laughs> What kind of experiment is needed? Um, and right. so how when I mean you, testable now, have the experimentalists, I mean yeah. Have the experimentalists told you, you know, in how many years they might actually be able to do something like that or something? Well, I think I, I think what's nice is that um, we can already so uh, uh, when I mean by current technology, I just mean that already we can use data from previous experiments to already rule out part of the parameter space of the theory. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, effectively, this decoherence versus diffusion trade-off is like a sandwich. It's a, we, like we sandwich, um, you know, you're squeezing it from both sides. You're squeezing the theory from both sides. It needs to either have a lot of diffusion or it needs to have short decoherence times. And so you can perform these two experiments. And any experiment you do is going to squeeze the theory from these both directions. And so the question is, you know, will we get to a point where we can squeeze the, it out completely or even verify it um and you know that we only gave very broad bounds and um there's already a, like an ultra local non-relativistic version which we ruled out so in that sense we can already rule out kind of the, the the most naive theory that you could write down um uh, is already ruled out so um you know, in order to rule out some other theories, you know, one needs to improve it by a few orders of magnitude. But my understanding is that this is possible. Um, yeah. So, the, I mean, as you are aware, there is a, you know, some sort of race of uh, keeping uh, more massive things uh, in quantum states for longer. So that right. But I guess cool. one of our one of the reasons we're interested in talking to experimentalists is that the figures of merit we've found are different to the ones people usually try and optimize so and and often don't even publish so for example we are interested in um the mass density the actual the mass probability density turns out to be the most important or often the most important figure of merit and when it comes to uh, so uh, you know buckyballs are not that impressive here gold <laughs> is what is more impressive um and with respect to cavendish experiments we actually don't care about 
how heavy your one kilogram mass is. We want to know how long did you have to average over? How big is your noise? And so we're hoping that these figures of merit can be used. Um, and, and, and people are doing these microscopic tests, you know, including at Vienna, where they are measuring the gravitational field with high precision. But what's important to us is the averaging that is being done, because that is they're averaging away the noise, and we're interested in the noise signal. How much noise do they have? Um, so and part of so this is a call yeah. out for publishing these figures of merit. So if you, you know, somebody told you, here's one billion of resources, you decide what experiment it goes to with respect to testing that theory, what should, would people do? You know, you have a genie in a bottle, you can wish whatever you want. Right. I mean, for one billion, you can buy a football team or you can do you know, these entangling experiments. And I think I would go for the entangling experiment. Right, right. No, um, no, the question was what experiment? What is the crucial experiment that is adapted exactly to testing this approach? What uh, well, so the, the um, so these are just, cav or, I mean, these are just ordinary Cavendish experiments and uh, double slit experiments. So th that's what you want to aim for. Um, they're already being done. It's just a matter of improving their, the, and the do accuracy you, and of the do you need experiment the, and the coherence and do you need the, gold atom interference. I, I see. And you need both of them. So you need you both of them because you're squeezing the theory from both directions. Oh. Oh, OK, OK, I see. Right. And so for the experiments that they do in Vienna, that is a Cavendish experiment, essentially, for the classical part, uh, does it is it suitable for you or not? I didn't understand with the time averaging. Do you right. Need the... So what's crucial is the time averaging. Um, and because they have to do a lot of time averaging, because you know, I mean, the thing is, gravity is super weak. And so, and the noise often is quite large. So even in the Cavendish experiment, you know, you have to sit there and this torsion pendulum is getting hit by molecules and is moving around. People often aren't always so worried about this because they can average over a long period of time. So what we're saying is we don't, we, we want you to minimize that noise over a short period of time. And I so see. that's the call out, I guess. I see, I see. Yeah, because um, it takes two months to do a measurement from what I remember. Right. So they're doing a lot of averaging in Vienna. And so so it's it's, it's unclear what I, I, I you know, in, in all honesty, it's a bit unclear to me which which um, implementations will have the least amount of noise. And that's but that's what we're aiming for. I see. Thank you. Yeah, that clarifies a lot. Thanks. In, in terms of the prior, um, you know, I, I actually think that when you go back, you know, I was actually looking at some old essays and I think, you know, in the 50s, there was a lot of debate about whether we should quantize the field and people were kind of 50-50 on this because gravity, I think, is this was viewed as this background structure. I mean, if you think what people who believe in quantum gravity believe, they believe that quantum theory, which applies in our lab, and, you know, the wave function we assign to a molecule in our lab can be applied to the whole universe. And that's a big jump. And maybe it's true, but it's a big, it's a huge leap. Likewise, you know, all our quantum theories are quantum theories where time is a parameter. I don't know how to do it in any other way. I don't even know how to set the initial conditions if I don't know the metric. You know, if I don't know, if I, if I want to start with an initial Cauchy hypersurface, how do I do that? If uh, non-perturbatively, if I don't even know what the metric is and I'm taking superpositions over metric, that to me feels like a big, you know, it feels to me like gravity is really different. And so... I would say that I be, I think it's a real open question. I agree. I mean, look, I I totally see what you're saying, and this. Um, I mean, I will put it this way. I think the correct stance is to be agnostic. Then there is a question of people just doing random stuff, but is this is different. It's uh, it's more targeted. It's true that uh, I mean, even in fifty seven, that we cite all this paper all the time. Feynman was saying. Guys, I mean, if you just put something in a superposition, then what do we have a superposition of? Uh, because everything sources gravity, do we have a superposition of the gravitational field right. immediately? And you're essentially saying, well, here's a way to test it. That's what's going on, or not? Well, I, I'm saying that there's. A, well, first of all, I'm saying that there's a uh, that 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 thought experiment is is not will lead you to the wrong conclusion because you need to you need to if you consider stochastic processes then then that thought experiment does not rule out classical gravity. And so there is therefore this, you know, we've, I guess I would say, look, we've constructed a theory and 
there's no quantum theory of gravity. So there is really something to test here. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. It's interesting. I have to look uh, to understand a bit intuitively what's the... Um, so these requirements, I don't get them. I need to... So you're saying that you care about the density, not about how much the mass is, uh, how high is the density of the mass, and uh, uh, you need a short uh, measurement so that uh, you don't kill all the noise somehow on the side of the classical. That's right, yeah. Yeah, this is it's an interesting game because it's different than the usual game we play with all the other stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Thanks. I, I need to look more into what you have done to say something more. Great. Well, thanks so much for an interesting discussion. Jonathan, we have one last question here in the room. Huh? Sorry, I just wanted to ask, I can see how you, how you can rule things out uh, by squeezing the parameter space. Do you have a specific idea for uh, how to show that theory is true if it is? Well, I, I mean, obviously, if you so the, if you do your, if at some point you find a limitation, like you can't reduce the noise beyond a certain amount in a Cavendish experiment, and you can, you know, or if you, um, or if you do a decoherence experiment and you find that, you know, mo molecules, that there's a limitation to how coherent you can make gold atoms for example then th those would be positive tests of the of the theory it, we've also we're, you know also suggesting some astrophysical ones as well thank you All right with that Jordan, i thank you um Great. i i will stop the recording all right